Hey you, watching this video, name your favorite Jewish character in any Marvel adaptation from the past couple of decades. I'm not joking, go to the comments and leave their name below, I'll wait. You said Moon Knight, didn't you? Or you couldn't think of one. Those are my predictions for 90% of you. Maybe there's one or two Ben Grimm's down there but I'm willing to bet that a big chunk of you weren't able to name one, and that's weird. Don't worry, I'm not faulting you, dear viewer. I'm faulting these adaptations themselves, and the people that make them. Because despite these projects existing at the intersection of cinema and comics, two industries with a rich history of Jewish involvement and influence, Jewish characters seem oddly absent. In this video, then, we're going to look at a few examples of Jewish effacement in Marvel superhero media, and speculate a little as to what's happening here and why. And finally, we'll attempt to look to the future. But first, I want to make an important disclaimer. I'm not Jewish, not even close. I'm a white Briton who grew up in a very Christian-y, atheist -y place. The environment of my youth was not a place you could describe as multicultural. My familiarity with modern Jewish culture comes primarily via American media, and I barely know the Talmud from the Torah. So why am I making this video? Well, this is the fifth pillar of garbage community video, and if you're new here, that means that this video video's topic was chosen by my Patreon supporters. Certain patrons get to suggest ideas, and other patrons get to vote on the suggested ideas, so in a nutshell, I didn't pick this topic. I will of course endeavour to approach this idea in the most sensitive way I can, and I've done my best to familiarise myself with existing takes on this topic from Jewish Voices, some of which I've linked in the description below. This is one of the reasons that this video is coming out a little late, mid-June rather than late May. I've really tried to do my research here. That being said, if anyone watched feels at all uncomfortable with the idea of my diving into such a fraught topic from an outsider's perspective, please feel no pressure to continue watching this video. But with all that being said, let's get into the various ways in which these comic book adaptations efface Jewish identity, because there's a couple of different types of effacement at play here, and I think we should start with perhaps the most basic one, times when the adaptations in question just kinda ignored the Jewish identity of certain characters. See, here's the thing. Do, do you see what I did there? Yeah, we're talking about Ben Grimm. Ben's a character who's very often been written and drawn as Jewish, ever since his creation at the hands of Jack Kirby, though this was not always made obvious. Kirby, like so many other early comic book pioneers, was a Jewish man. Back when comics looked more like this than this, though, openly discussing or addressing religion on the page was something of a taboo, and so Ben's Judaism wasn't explicitly confirmed in-universe for decades. Despite this, Ben's heritage was something of an open secret. Just look at this Hanukkah card Kirby drew back in the 70s, or the not-so-subtle way Ben's transformed persona reflects the golem of Jewish folklore. I've linked an essay about this from Jewish Current in the description, so check that out if you want a deeper look into comic book Ben's Judaism. Until recently, Ben would likely have been the most well-known figure of all the ones we'll discuss in this video, not least due to a string of live-action appearances back towards the start of the millennium. The Thing starred in four films across a couple of decades, which wasn't nothing in the pre-MCU era. But despite these repeated adaptations, something was missing, and that was any real reflection of the character's faith. Look, I'll show you the only direct indication of this throughout the character's live-action tenure. Huh? You think you can talk to me like that? What huh? the hell is the matter with you? Huh? Huh? Ah. Ma. Just that we can't do nothing. Huh? Ma, I, I swear to God. Didn't do this. Did you see it? It's the menorah in the background of this flashback scene. Now, I'm not trying to say that this moment fails as inclusion or representation. The people over at New Voices really seemed to like it. What I am saying, though, is that this probably shouldn't be it across all these films. Despite the flawed projects he's in, I actually really like Michael Chiklis as The Thing, and he gets a decent amount of screen time. It's a shame, then, that his Jewish identity seems entirely absent here, especially given the general waspification of these films. It's not like there's no room for it, either. A lot of the second film revolves around Reed and Sue's impending seemingly Christian marriage, as well as Ben's deepening relationship to Alicia Masters. That's ample ground to explore any possible inner difference Ben feels from his teammates, along with the outer alienation. Equally, there's plenty of space for a discussion, however brief, between Ben and Alicia about, say, what a ceremony of theirs might look like in the future. But the films seem to go out of their way to ignore this angle. For instance, check this scene out. It's okay. If there's a god, he hates me. 
The issue here isn't that Ben displays a moment of agnosticism. His transformation may well have prompted a crisis of faith. It's the fact that this is coupled with him saying God, something which traditionally the Jewish often make a point to avoid, and that the rest of the film makes no attempt to contextualize this moment as anything other than what it appears to be, on surface level, an agnostic man questioning his existence. Had Ben been given any Jewish markers in these films, this scene could have remained the same and grown even more compelling. Not merely a man questioning his own existence, but also his faith, and doing so in a way which displays the depth of his disillusionment. But this isn't the case. All it gives us is this moment, which, taken in isolation, feels like an ever so subtle instance of erasure. After this, the 2015 adaptation had a chance to write the ship, and it kind of did with that background menorah, and sure, that's better than nothing. Acknowledging Ben's Judaism in a Fantastic Four film is a step in the right direction, but after the whole heap of nothing we got before, that's a pretty low bar. It's kind of a similar story, albeit maybe even worse, with another Jewish Marvel hero's time on the big screen, and that's the X-Men's own Kitty Pride. Similar because this is another case where you could watch the films and have no inkling of the comic book character's heritage, and worse because this time there's not even a background menorah. Pride had a couple of cameos in the early X-Men films, before getting bigger roles in The Last Stand and Days of Future Past, being portrayed by Elliot Page in both films. And again, Page does a great job with the role, but again it's odd that there's absolutely no indication that these films are at all interested in recognising Kitty as Jewish, particularly in a film series like X-Men, which is all about about prejudice and marginalised people. The intersection between Kitty's Jewish and mutant identities is ground rich in opportunities for exploring these themes, as the comics have demonstrated. What makes it even weirder is that this intersection between the Jewish experience and the mutant one is an angle these very films have played up through Magneto's story, but Kitty's never brought into that or anything similar. And it's not a question of narrative redundancy. The experiences of these two characters are anything but alike, and as such, there's no way that Kitty would understand these intersecting identities in the same way Eric would. Given her power set and typically ambiguous ethnic appearance, there's interesting things to explore around the idea of passing with Kitty. And yeah, obviously we never got any of that. Animation has been slightly better with Kitty. I'm thinking of one moment from X-Men Evolution in particular, which briefly shows Kitty celebrating Hanukkah with her family during a holiday episode. And like Ben in Fant Stick, that's better than nothing but again, that's a very low bar. It's at this point I'd like to start thinking about the reasons behind these omissions, to bring the why into conversation with the what, because these aren't instances where filmmakers have just forgotten to add these elements in, or where they weren't aware of them. You can't write a Fantastic Four movie in the early 2000s without being aware of the recent confirmation of Ben's Judaism, but equally I doubt omissions like this are the result of conscious anti-Semitic intentions, especially in the X-Men films. Instead, let's think about the nature of adaptations like these. When it comes to bringing comic book characters to the big screen, it's not like a Roger Rabbit process. It's not like the essence of Kitty Pride exists somewhere out there for a screenwriter to summon into a script. It's not some unbroken transfer from one medium to the other. It's more that when these films are written, a whole bunch of new characters are created. They're modelled after their comic book counterparts in that they typically share a name and physical attributes with them, but there's no transcendent spirit links between, say, Tom Holland's Spider-Man and the Lee Ditko version. No, the former is essentially a separate character, albeit one based heavily on the latter, in terms of background, appearance, and personality. Some of these filmic versions of familiar characters resemble their inspirations more closely and some more loosely, and there's various reasons for this. Perhaps the writer in question doesn't think a certain detail or trait works with the story they're looking to tell. Perhaps they think they know better than some silly comic book writers, and reinvent the character more drastically, keeping only the most basic holdovers from their print origins. Or perhaps the writer has nothing against the trait, but due to the narratives they're looking to create, due to pacing and time constraints, they prioritise including other traits. To be clear, I'm not trying to trivialise the impact on one's life being Jewish has by discussing it as merely a character trait, like it's a favourite food or something. But to the observer, for characters like these, 
being Jewish often operates in a similarly less than obvious way. It might have a lot to do with their worldview or philosophy, but it rarely becomes visible, especially against the backdrop of the sort of extraordinary events these films tend to focus on. I think this general idea is behind a lot of this Jewish effacement. At the end of the day, a character like Kitty Pride only gets so much screen time across the X-Men franchise. There's not really that much to her character, and that's partially because as a secondary character there's not enough time or narrative space to develop her beyond a handful of kind of generic core traits. That she's devoted to the X-Men, that she's a do-gooder, etc. It seems to me that in this case, and in similar ones, the reason these characters' Jewish identities aren't visibly present in their cinematic depictions is simply that the writers didn't consider these Jewish identities to be aspects important enough, central enough to these characters to warrant inclusion, or rather to warrant screen time and narrative space. Particularly with these X-Men films, a lot of the creatives involved were Jewish. The directors and writers, for instance. So is this Jewish erasure? Or is it just a case of these characters only appearing in stories which are more concerned with their plots and their leads than with the personal backgrounds of supporting characters? Well, it's very easy to excuse it like this in the abstract, but when you leave abstraction and return to the films in question, the texts themselves, it becomes harder to justify these excuses. Because sure, these guys don't get an abundance of screen time, but they don't get none. There's a scattering of moments with these characters across these films, which feel like perfect opportunities to dig into these people, and to suggest at the presence and impact of their ethno-religious backgrounds. Like for instance the aforementioned Ben scene, or the Bobby Kitty ice skating sequence in X-Men The Last Stand. And sure, it's not necessarily a problem that every moment like this doesn't brush up against the fact that these characters' inspirations are Jewish, but it is odd that none of them do. But I'm not convinced that any of these moments are direct enough, unambiguous enough to be termed active examples of Jewish erasure. Theirs is a more passive effacement, what we might term a benign issue of representation. That's not to minimise it. This pattern of movies not bothering to adapt or focus on Jewish identities remains present and problematic. But these examples, they're significant mostly as missed opportunities, and as indicators of the industry's and the public's covert biases. No, for something near to actual erasure, something which does active harm, we're best to look at a more recent franchise, the much lauded Marvel Cinematic Universe. The case of Wanda Maximoff's adaptation is a strange one, but in some ways it's a direct continuation of some of the issues we've talked about thus far, especially the idea that adaptations of comic book characters are in a sense just new characters created to fit into whatever story the screenplay is telling, who just happen to resemble their inspiration in major or minor ways. Because for the first few years of her MCU tenure, this Wanda didn't actually resemble this Wanda particularly closely, in personal history, in power set, or in what what actually happened to her. And that's no great crime in itself, especially since, as I discussed in last month's Patreon exclusive, the abstract idea of comic book accuracy is a nebulous and largely unattainable goal. Due to, you know, comics being comics, 616 Wonder has changed in many ways over the years, even with regard to her parentage. But one thing which has remained pretty consistent is her identity as a Jewish Romani woman. This is a facet of comic book Wonder's character that matters, and has weight. And yeah, it isn't present at all in the MCU. Broadly, there is a reason for this less faithful adaptation of Wanda. So many of the factors which were important to Wanda's story in the comics weren't available for use in Age of Ultron, for legal reasons. The X-Men, Magneto, the Brotherhood, mutants and all that. And within the comparably limited scope of the MCU, it makes a sort of sense to tie her origins into pre-established elements, like the Mind Stone and Hydra, but we'll come back to Hydra in a minute. Add this to the fact that the comics themselves seem really fond of retconning Wanda's story and identity every now and then, and it's understandable that MCU Wanda isn't a one-to-one -one fit with her 616 counterpart. That Joss Whedon and co pretty much started fresh, creating essentially a new character, with a new past and family from a new location, and then ported over a few similarities, like her name, her brother, and their relationship with the Avengers, starting off antagonistically before joining up. 
The Age of Ultron writers picked a handful of traits and details which they felt to be key characteristics for Wanda Maximoff and wrote them into this character. But crucially, her Romani and Jewish identities didn't make the cut. Evidently, they weren't seen as important enough to be worth bringing into the mix, by Whedon or by anyone afterwards. At this point, the case of Wanda Maximoff might look like more of the same, quote, benign neglect we saw in the X-Men and the Fantastic Four films, albeit perhaps more egregious given Wanda's comparative multitude of appearances. But it isn't. This is malignant, damaging, because it isn't simply that the MCU hasn't incorporated these aspects into Wanda's character. No, it's that it's repeatedly taken the character in directions antithetical to her original Jewish identity. First, yeah, Hydra. Sure, it makes sense within the ongoing narrative of the MCU to tie the twins into Hydra. There's an elegance to the way the Maximoffs and their origins flow naturally from the events of the first Avengers film. But did everyone involved with Age of Ultron forget Hydra's origins? Surely they must have done, or else just been entirely unaware of the original Maximoffs' Jewish identities, because otherwise, how did no one see the massive symbolic red flags raised by this new origin? I made a Star Wars video recently, and one commenter requested I cut out a soundbite from that video's audio and reuse it in the future, and this seems like the perfect opportunity. Because having originally Jewish characters, whose sometimes father is a Holocaust survivor, become not merely non-Jewish, but also members of a historically Nazi-aligned fascist cell, that's fucking yikes. It doesn't end there, though. It's not quite as obvious and outrageous as the Hydra stuff, but Wanda's room in Civil War includes a little cross as part of the set dressing, and this is insidious in its own way. It feels like a distillation of the unconscious homogenizing pressures Hollywood exerts over every story, every character which passes through its machinery. Difference and diversity ground down to a smooth paste of normative cultures and values. Every character becomes a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant unless it's explicitly specified specified otherwise. The set dressers probably didn't even give this a second thought. They probably just threw it in there to add to the whole gothic aesthetic MC Hugh Wonder had in her earlier appearances. There's even a Tumblr post I found which does a deep dive on this cross and the rest of Wonder's room, and it suggests some semi-plausible in-universe explanations for how Wonder could have this displayed and still be Jewish in the MCU. And that's some impressive headcanoning, but even if the Russo brothers came out tomorrow and said, okay, yeah, Yep, that's all canon now, it doesn't matter. That's not the point. The point is that this film gave us this shot, without complicating or nuancing it whatsoever. Intentionally or not, Civil War symbolically baptizes this Wanda as, culturally at least, a Christian. So what we've seen in Wanda is different to the other cases we've discussed. It's not just the films ignoring this aspect of her comic book identity, it's them intentionally or not taking her in an outright contrary direction. At best, this is pretty insensitive. At worst, well, I'd be interested in hearing how you guys feel about these matters. I don't want to speak for anyone else, but I imagine I'm not the only one who thinks this whole angle of MCU wonder is a big oof. As we get into the final stretch of this video though, I want to move away from specific examples and consider the matter more broadly. The first point I want to stress is that this matters, and if you're into comics or comic book media at all, then you should be concerned by it. Even if you're not Jewish, even if you're not particularly passionate about representation. Because in many ways, comic book culture is Jewish and has been from the start. As I said, I've linked some articles in the description, so go check them out, but essentially, the real creators, the real innovators for this new form back towards the start of the 20th century were Jewish Americans who poured their identities and experiences into these pages and these characters. I guarantee you, whoever your favourite superhero is, they were created or otherwise shaped by Jewish writers and artists. So modern comic book media has a special responsibility to get this representation right, and for the most part, it kind of hasn't. Look, I'm sure it wasn't the easiest thing in the world getting characters like Wanda from page to screen, especially when rights issues constrain and limit the things you maybe wanted to do. And with all the characters and films we've spoken about in this video, there was no doubt a balancing act between authentically adapting, exploring, and representing these characters, and the requisite heavy plotting and universe building demanded by these franchises. There's also, arguably, a line to walk between authentic representation and faux progressive signal but that's not an excuse for consistently doing nothing, or next to nothing. 
I want to end on an optimistic note though, because, and remember, this is just my opinion, I think Moon Knight showed a clear step forward for the MCU in this matter. I know this is likely to be unpopular, I remember the Moon Knight Twitter discourse after all, but I think that the inclusion of Mark's Jewish identity in the Disney Plus series is significant enough to warrant at least some faint praise. Because even though the visual markers of this identity are only on screen for like a minute or less in episode 5, it's a pivotal scene. Mark's dissociation comes at his mother's Shiva. In many ways, this is the inciting incident for the show, and for these developments in Mark slash Steven's character and life. And the shot of Mark tearing off his yarmulke in a mixture of grief, trauma, and rage, that's a pretty important moment, symbolically speaking. In a sense, we're seeing Mark tear his identity from his body, as it's shortly afterwards that Steven pops up for the first time in a long while. The fact that this psychological break is expressed and communicated communicated to us via the cultural artifacts of Mark's Judaism is immensely interesting. If the quote benign effacement of Jewish identity in comic book media we discussed earlier can be understood as writers, producers, and directors viewing the Jewish identity as an inessential character trait, a reasonable aspect not to bring over from page to screen during the adaptation process, then I think this Moon Knight moment shows the MCU fixing this attitude, and realizing that the Jewish identities of these characters can be an opportunity a vehicle for authentic exploration and character moments. And I get that people felt this solitary moment was too small a gesture, I do, but I don't think anyone would have had a problem with the representation in this show if it hadn't been so severely lacking in the MCU before this point. That suggests, to me at least, that the issue isn't with the show, the text itself, but with its context. And if that's the case, shouldn't we view this as a step forward, however slight? Look, maybe I'm wrong, please let me know if so. And even if this is a step forward, it looks like there's still a pretty long way to go. Let's see how Kitty and Ben are treated in the MCU. Let's see if the MCU ever remembers the Jewish identity of Wanda's comic book inspiration, and attempts to make amends for its previous fraught engagement with her character. But for now, I hope some of you have felt this video's been an accurate and fair analysis of where things stand. There's obviously a lot more to say about this topic. I cut a lot from this video, it could honestly have been like twice as long. The scope was originally beyond Marvel too, I cut out a planned section on the Harley Quinn show, and there's ways that even ostensibly non-Jewish characters characters like Bucky or Spider-Man could have been brought into this conversation. But if I'd have kept writing, it would have taken ages longer to come out, and it's already two weeks late. I'm happy to return to these topics another time if people want me to, but honestly, while there is plenty more to be said on this topic, I'm probably not the right person to say it. To my Jewish viewers, I've done my best to approach this video in the correct way, but everyone has blind spots, so if I've messed anything up here, or if any part of this video feels insensitive in any way, please don't hesitate to call me out, and I'll try to do better in the future. Pending any such smackdowns though, I want to thank everyone for watching this video, and if you want to pick the topic for the next Pillar of Garbage Patreon community videos, don't hesitate to check out my Patreon linked in the description below. You also get access to a whole bunch of exclusive videos. And speaking of Patreon, I'll end this video in the traditional way, with a big thank you to all of my supporters on screen now, particularly Kevin Douglas, Ian Fifield, and Thrawn7.